we have here from Australia, right? We have Heidi Winter and Jesse Richardson. And we ask that you give them your attention. Please turn off your cell phones. Don't have calls going on in the background with ringers, right? Turn all phones on vibrate. And because uh, this is being recorded and, you know, uh, and uh, the kids are all right. I'm looking forward to this because because I have my own little kids who cause a lot of trouble, and I really hope that my kids are all right, too. So please give your attention to our fine presenters here. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Diana Initiative. So it's a fantastic day we're having today so far. So whose first time is this to Diana Initiative? That's a few of you. And who's been before? It's a great conference, isn't it? Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here today, and welcome to The Kids Are All Right. We'll be giving a quick presentation today on some of the work that we've been doing with our organization, Kids Security Day. So what we're going to be doing is, do is give you a quick introduction, and then we're going to be talking about our case study that we'll be talking about today, which is about how we went over to Papua New Guinea recently and um, did some introductory uh, kids' workshops and pilot programs over there. And we'll also be sharing with you the resources and frameworks that we actually work with. And then we'll just be quickly summing it up for everything and then ending with some Q&A today. So without further ado, we'll kick on. And so, hi, my name's Heidi. I'm the founder of Kids Security Day. I am currently uh, working primarily in security operations, so I'm with the blue team. I'm primarily working with incident response. I do a little bit in the governance, risk, and compliance spaces as well. Uh, but mostly when it comes to security operations, it's where I mostly am. I've been in IT for over 20 years now, and I absolutely love it. Hey, I'm Jessie. I'm a mentor with Kids Security Day and have been since 2018. I, um, I originally trained as a maths teacher, uh, so high school maths teacher, but now I work in IT and I work really closely with my cybersecurity colleagues delivering IT projects. Um, and I just really love the work that we do, so I'm so happy we can be here to talk about it. And um, Jessie's also the host of uh, one of our workshops, the Kids Can Code workshop. So she not only mentors the kids, she develops um, some of the workshop content and delivers it as well. So um, a little bit about Kids Security Day. So we started off in uh, 2017 as um, an independent workshop that was primarily held at uh, women in tech events, so a lot like this one, but for younger ages. So we started off at Greenlight for Girls, which is run with um, Girl Scouts primarily. We were invited to come along and uh, provide a cybersecurity themed STEM workshop. And at the time when we were doing this, um, there were not really very many cybersecurity engagement and workshops for the youth within Australia. So this is back in 2017. Within here in America, you've got stuff like um, CTFs, like Pico CTF, which is an absolutely fantastic CTF run for um, the younger age groups. You've got things like Roots at DEF CON, which is more all about the youth and cybersecurity and both security in general, and also things like Hack for Kids. Uh, but in Australia at the time, this sort of thing didn't really exist at all. So um, we... So what we were doing necessarily wasn't new itself. However, within our country, the application hadn't really existed very much. So we didn't have any frameworks to work from. Um, we had a lot of restrictive policies that we found out that we had to work with. So things like um, making sure that we had the appropriate um, clearances for our staff and the right operational licenses to be able to do this sort of work. Um, and also there wasn't that many kids-friendly content available to actually be able to apply. And when you'd go and actually look these things up, there's maybe some research papers on the particular subject. When it came to actually applying that in the field, there wasn't very much freely available. So what we ended up doing, and uh, you can see in our top left-hand corner, we've actually got a picture from our 2017 event. And that's where we actually decided, okay, so we haven't had to do this before, so what are we gonna do? I really like Pico CTF, so we just ran the kids through Pico CTF, and they absolutely loved it. They picked it up really quickly. One of the girls that was there, she was like, I don't even like computers. I don't want to do this. This is boring. She crossed her arms, sat back, and just went, man. Within five minutes, she was fighting for the keyboard with the person she was working with because she wanted to have a go. It's really good engagement. Um, 
so at that time, back in 2017, the kids also had quite a lot of um, education in schools when it comes to programming. However, cybersecurity education has only been rolled out within our state and territory that we did this workshop in, in uh, I think in the last 12 months. So now it's currently getting delivered, but at that time it was very basic sort of level of availability. So um, we found over time as we worked for other workshops um, that uh, we can see the maturity of the education coming through with the kids. And it's not necessarily because they're coming back again and we're giving them the same content. It's not that at all. We change the content every year, but we see that they're um, maturing when it comes to the base level skills as they're actually coming to our actual workshops and events. So we, that was a really good, like, fantastic success with that first event. So we ended up running through uh, the next year as a standalone event. So we brought in a whole bunch of different security workshops, whether or not it was um, cyber safety education that we worked with um, the Australian Federal Police to actually deliver. Um, and we also had physical security as well, because hands-on with um, locks is actually quite engaging if you have had any experience in those areas. Um, we also offered um, some other additional workshops and we ran it as a, in a conference style. We had some kids come up from um, Sydney that were extremely experienced within security and uh, applying it um, and they came and gave a talk. So we presented in a format where kids with the relative age group would come up, give a presentation keynote and the kids would actually go off to the rest of the day and do workshops. So it's like a for kids conference really at the end of it all. Um, so since then, we've also been engaged to provide um, additional workshops and days. So we were engaged to develop the um, indigenous cyber games. So for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that we um, put together and helped with a pilot program within Australia to, for targeted delivery for cyber education to um, those diverse groups. So we've done a lot of workshops and a lot of events all around Australia and also online since then. We've also moved to um, online with digital delivery thanks to COVID and the pandemic lockdowns. So we've been doing quite a lot in the last few years and yeah, which brings us on to a case study. Yeah, so we've done a lot of events and it's been a lot of work along the way. Um, and yeah, that does bring us to our case study that we'll talk about now about Papua New Guinea. So uh, with Papua New Guinea, uh, we were contacted by a group wanting to know if we'd consider bringing cyber skills education to Papua New Guinea in association with, at the time, the University of Queensland. So this group was CPL Foundation, who's headed by um, Sir Mahesh Patel. They've been doing a lot of fantastic work within the um, Papua New Guinea space when it comes to uplifting skills and providing opportunity for women and girls. So they have a really good background there and they have a lot of local links to be able to um, deliver something um, like this in a positive way moving forward. So um, the challenges that we were presented with was, as a whole, um, Papua New Guinea is um, pretty low tech. Uh, does anyone here know much about Papua New Guinea? Okay, well, we'll make sure you pro we'll provide you some more information on that and moving forward. So pretty low tech, low digital literacy. There was no in-school programs when it comes to um, anything technology related and definitely not cybersecurity related. Um, no coding classes, for example. So, um, but we were also advised that we could expect the kids to be pretty um, enthusiastic about the way that we would be presenting this. And one thing that um, we would be presented with is that privileges that we take for granted are a rare luxury within Papua New Guinea. So a bit more about Papua New Guinea. It's a fairly small island, uh, Pacific Island to the north of Australia. And it's really, really beautiful. Uh, we did, we have found some stats, notably only 11% of all residents have wired internet and 53% of the population have mobile phones. But we, we were really appreciative to CPL Foundation that they made a, a considerable effort to take us out and to show us their country. Like they took us to the beach and stuff and it was really beautiful. And just the people were so lovely, like these children, they were so thankful for the opportunity to go to this conference and to get experience with the computers. So it was a really, really nice experience there. 
So a bit about the workshops that we took to Papua New Guinea for this um, event. We, we have like a suite of workshops that we've been building up over the last few years. So we presented several options to CPL Foundation when they approached us. And these were the workshops that they settled on. Um, it was really important to them that we had a coding workshop. So we brought along our Kids Can Code. Um, and that just, it looks at a bit of like what coding looks like in real life, as well as more kid-friendly block-based coding. And we tie it back, um, the outcomes of that workshop, we tie them back to how coding uh, is transferable, like learning one language, and then you start learning more languages, and then um, how coding is involved with cybersecurity day-to-day -day things. So got that one. Uh, physical security, this is our big like ethics kind of workshop. So it's really engaging, hands-on, the kids really love it. They get to play with locks and they learn how locks work. But we also, the main outcomes is about the three golden rules when you're dealing with locks about, you know, having permission and not breaking things and, yeah. So uh, we, uh, we always see a lot of positivity coming out of the physical security workshop. Digital traces, it's a really timely workshop because we, our attendees are six to 16 year olds and they're just starting out their internet presence, a lot of them. Uh, so digital traces really brings it home about what information can be found online and how long that information lives online and to really think about what you put up. And one of the, out, uh, the outcomes for that workshop, we want the kids to take those messages home and share that with their family. And we want them to even start cleaning up their digital presence as a result of that workshop and to um, think about what they're putting online going forward. Uh, and it, it's really fun. We um, tie it into cartoon characters and stuff. So the, the kids are actually cyber stalking their favorite cartoon characters. <laughs> um, yeah, so that goes really well. We've also got cyber safety, which as Heidi was saying, cyber safety is really maturing in Australia, but we found that there wasn't a formal channel of cyber safety in schools in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so we really took that back to the basics and made sure to cover what they could be missing out on. Um, so it's a lot of like staying safe online and um, thinking about your interactions that you have online. Yeah, with that one, I used a lot of my personal stories. So I grew up unsupervised on the internet from the age of 11 onwards. And I didn't have any cybersecurity education at all, cyber safety education growing up. So it was definitely learned by doing in those particular cases. So um, when it came to delivering the cyber safety messages, I'd also um, provide a lot of background in regards to, so this happened to me. So what do you think happened next? And the kids really picked up on it really, really quickly. And being relatable is super important when you're delivering those sort of messages. Um, don't just tell kids what they have to do. Yes or no. Tell them what happens and the why and make sure that they understand it. And it seemed to work out pretty okay. The kids definitely had a lot higher amount of engagement on that workshop. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the drone fun. It's a lot of a lot of fun that session. Uh, it's our team building session. So we know that we need to work in teams, uh, but a lot of our workshops are more individual. So this one, we get the kids to work together to mm -hmm. um, control a sensor-based drone and get it through some hoops. Yeah, and so as part of that, we also introduce the concept of sensors and how they work as well. So with this particular workshop, we start off and just like, here's an automated drone and we get them to just play with it in a team. And then we go, okay, can you get it through that hoop as a team? Because everyone understands that working in security is a team sport, right? And that's one thing that you really need to understand from the beginning. And so that's one of the reasons why we do it as a team activity, but we get them to try and actually try to put this um, through that particular hoop in the groups. And first time, it's not really too great, is it? No, not at all. And then after that, we explain as to how the actual item works. These are the sensors, and this is how they're placed, and this is how this actual operation works entirely with these little mini drones that we use. And then we get them to go back and try it again. And do you think they do a lot better? They do a lot better. And it's all about understanding how things work. Yeah. 
it's always, it's a hoot. And then we've got our cyber games, which is the CTF of our conference. So you'll hear a lot more about that. But a bit more about these workshops. We were running them as a junior, senior, and a train the trainer session. So one of the things that we got to do while we were over there was a session with some uh, Papua New Guinea-based adult mentors working for the CPL Foundation. And we ran through all of our workshops with the mentors. And they had a pretty similar digital literacy to the kids. Uh, but like, they're really picking up that work and taking on our materials and um, taking, like, enhancing the reach that we had because we could only we were only there for about a week so mm -hmm. there's only so many kids that we could reach while we were there um so that was really good as well and oh um one thing that we noticed we had these were the workshops that we ran but when we pitched them to cpl foundation we pitched them the same way that we have them written for australian kids and then we saw the flyer come out that was advertised locally about the workshops and they'd rewritten the descriptions of the workshops to be more relatable to the kids. So then we took how those were rewritten mm -hmm. and paired back our workshop uh, content to make it a bit more basic and a bit more beginner yeah. in line with how they'd rewritten. So that's, we'd taken that as an indicator of how we should change things to make sure that it was friendly for their um, kids over there. And a really good explanation of that is the fact that how do you explain code to someone that doesn't know what code is? And so they change it to pictures and numbers and how to actually communicate in that particular sense. So that's when we, when we're dialing it back so much that it's introductory language that we're using in all of our course content because it doesn't exist. Next one. Okay, so cyber games. So um, we use cyber games for skills validation, delivering education, providing targeted assistance, and also gathering quantifiable feedback, which is all common uses of capture the flag platforms, basically. So when it comes to the skills validation, um, the way that we actually ran these workshops over in Papua New Guinea is that the first day, we ran all the workshops that we previously were talking about on the, on the previous slide. When with all of that, we actually had key moments of key education points that we also ran back and validated on day two. So by incorporating those key um, education moments within the cyber games platform, we can validate as to whether or not that um, lessons have actually been held over and confirmed for the next day. So say for example, the physical security side of things, we talk about um, the ethical lessons so we talk heavily about the ethics and the concepts when it comes to those particular ethics and, um, and how they apply within the cybersecurity space and with your digital online use. And we also use that to validate that. Um, so um, we also obviously, um, as I said, we, we also use this platform to um, deliver new education and also validate the skills um, with the, uh, the retention. So um, basically, when it comes to the new content um, that we are also delivering when it comes to the cyber games, we deliver it in uh, Jeopardy format. So we will pick, so say, for example, introduction to cryptography. Let's use that as an example. Um, and then with the Jeopardy format, we have the introductory questions, which provide um, a lot of hints as to how to think through these particular problems and also approach these particular problems in a very basic format. And then what we'll be doing is that with the further ones, you'll be working with less hints, less um, encouragement, and you'll be working in the same sort of way. And then us to actually, um, at the final, you'll be also just doing it without any hints, using the same sort of methodology and learning. So that's the way that we're actually using that for, to deliver more education. So one thing we did find, though, um, is because we were dealing with... Um, groups that weren't so used to using computers. Um, moving forward, we probably would never include any special characters. It is super hard to say, for example, putting like in a bracket when you're not used to using a keyboard, pressing the shift button and also like the bracket button at the same time is really, really hard. And also when it came to um, them working out problems uh, um, on these particular um, 
this platform because the kids weren't actually used to using a computer to work from primarily. What they would do is that they'd work it out on a workbook next to themselves and then type it in separately. And that was the way that they were most comfortable using this particular platform. At the same time, um, a lot of them, uh, the questions were also encouraging the use of basic IT um, skills, which is, can you copy paste? Can you open a web browser? Can you search? Things along those lines, which are, I think, actually accessible under um, World Economic Forum um, basic um, assistance for IT and how they actually evaluate it. Um, so um, through the real-time dashboarding as well, which are provided um, by platforms such as, in this case, we use CTFD because it's a simple, easy-use platform. And also when it comes to delivering the ongoing skills, so we did train the trainer. We've also provided the local education staff so that way that they can continue to use platforms like this themselves. It's an open source platform. They can reuse it as they want. And that's the whole point of being able to continue this education. So through the real-time dashboarding provided by the Cyber Games, we can also provide assistance to the students that may be lagging behind or even outright failing to engage. Sorry, one sec. And um, we've got a whole bunch of mentors that we work with at all of these different events. And so um, their help, their are there to support when needed. So um, when you're delivering events, you need to take in feedback as well and measure through the program. And we can actually do that through platforms like this. So we can actually capture the quantifiable feedback um, and also use it in reporting. So say, for example, in this <laughs> this particular slide, you can see uh, that, that, yep, we've got 4,459 wrong submissions when it comes to all of the submissions on this particular day. However, we've got 2,173. That's really good. When you consider the IT literacy of the kids that we were dealing with and they had to learn how to use this platform from the beginning, and you can see the top, these are just the top 10 users. They did really, really well. They picked it up super quickly and they just ran with it. And you can actually capture that information and you can actually use it for um, future events. You can see as to progression as to how they're going moving forward. So it's something you really want to make sure that you capture those sort of statistics. Um, so one thing we will really say really quickly when it comes to um, designing um, <clears throat> these sort of um, events and these sort of um, CTF for um, local populations like this. One of the um, design questions that we actually did, because we do general um, knowledge questions at the beginning to be able to get the kids used to the actual platform. So they're just used to using the platform before we kick into the actual um, cyber games and CTF specific questions. Um, we had someone who was a Papua New Guinea native actually help us design some local language questions. So um, Tokpising is actually one of the most popular languages over there. There's a lot of languages in PNG, but that's one of the most commonly used ones. And we found that when we went to actually review at the end, there was some of the least popular questions and the lowest successful answers. The kids got really confused by them. Um, so we probably won't be doing that sort of individual tailoring in the future and just keep it very general knowledge and application. And something that kind of ties into this next slide, but noting what we were just saying about um, the lack of even copy and paste functionality, um, how we help the kids to get past that. We were doing a lot of like drawing up on the whiteboard the key combinations and and then like going through and helping them to, cause it like how they were comfortable writing the books was very slow for some of the exercises mm. that are all built around copy this and put it into a cipher thing and decode it. And, um, so by the end of the days, they were getting much better at copy paste and having multiple tabs open. Uh, we saw like such a um, development throughout the days. Yeah, um, and that comes a lot through the mentor interactions as well, with helping the kids work through um, what they're doing when they get um, like confused, basically. But um, so we work on a principle of leaving no one behind. When it comes to any of the design of the information that we actually provide, we cater for the, the lowest common and also the highest common so that like no one's left behind at any point in time. And we've also had some really good... Um, 
case studies in regards to, well, at least some good feedback when it comes to previous events. So um, when it came to um, the, um, the end of day one with the um, junior group, um, Jessie was actually helping out one of the girls uh, as just providing mentoring support as to how to actually work through some of the actual problems. And uh, the next day she came back in with a mum and was trying to find Jessie and she brought her a little bag. And we were talking to the mum and she said that when she came home, all she was talking about is Jessie, Jessie, Jessie. And as to how much of a good interaction she'd actually had. So um, it, it providing tailored support and actually making sure that you are actually dealing with these kids on the level that they need to um, is something you should really make sure that you actually do. And also, if you know anything about Australian um, customs and imports, it's super hard to get anything in. She actually managed to get the bag home with her as well. So yeah. it's a really good outcome. <laughs> it was a, a beautiful natural fiber woven bag. It was really, really nice. And like, that's just how we know that when we are saying leave no one behind, like it's times like that that we know that we're really succeeding. Cool. And now moving on from our case study, and into our framework and resources. Um, we're going to go through what we have for our events. And um, like we said, there weren't many resources when we got started. So hopefully like sharing ours will help anyone else get started as well. So we work on a framework when we put together our events for um, our community ones and also for our external partners. So at a high level, the framework that we've developed has five concepts. We've got the people, the policies, the platforms, the education, and the actual events. In practice, this framework actually expands to pages and pages of requirements and considerations when it comes to each of these different aspects. Uh, so as we've got a little bit of time today, because we've been talking so much so far, we'll be talking about what all these mean um, in a practical sense. So starting at the beginning, uh, we're talking about people and we're talking about finding the right people. When it comes to the mentors that we actually work with and the staff that uh, our team works with, we make sure at base they're all cleared. So what that means in um, Australia, we have state-based rules which determine as to whether or not you can work with children. In my state, it's called uh, Working with Vulnerable People Check. In New South Wales, which is the next state over, it's a completely different naming. But they all work on the same principles. It's a background check, criminal check, things along those lines. And it enables you to actually be able to work with children. So we make sure that all of our mentoring staff, anyone that comes anywhere near to the kids, um, is all cleared uh, in that sense. So we validate that as well before every event that we run with. We can also check that digitally, which is fantastic. But we make sure that those are all current before um, we actually run any events. We also check references as well when we're onboarding new mentoring staff. But when it also comes to these mentors as well, um, getting the right people also means that they've got the same, the right characteristics. Obviously, if you work with children, you probably should like children. If you don't like children, you probably should not actually come and do mentoring for younger kids. Um, when it comes to all these mentors as well, we make sure we provide training and we also set their expectations. So we've got a mentor code of conduct, which deems sets out everything that's expected when it comes to these particular interactions, where we hope we make sure everyone's fully aware as to their expectations. Um, we also make sure that they're fully trained when it comes to what's expected of them, how to work with kids, and also um, if something goes wrong, what to do. And we make sure that's validated frequently. We, we set the expectations when it also comes to the mentor expectations, um, in addition to that code of conduct. And when we are looking at um, having our, who we're getting as mentors as well, we look at um, representation because that matters for the kids to be seeing uh, all different kinds of people helping them with these cybersecurity uh, challenges. So we, for most of our events, we tend to get a 50-50 gender split amongst our mentors. And we also get a fair amount of age diversity and cultural diversity. Uh, so that's just another thing that we're thinking about um, getting mentors in? Yep. And one thing that's really important is that when it comes to the mentors that we have, most of them are from, actually, yeah, most of them uh, are from cybersecurity backgrounds. And technical skills can be learned 
but you need to make sure that people want to be there and actually learn those things. Um, you don't have to have, be a top pen tester. You don't have to have CVs in your name to be able to mentor kids effectively. You just need to be able to communicate and actually be seen to them. Um, and, yeah, so that's something which is super important. Uh, right, so next up we've got the policies and the platforms. So when I say that the mentors have code of conduct and expectations set on them, it's really super important that you also set the expectations early for the kids as well. We've got a code of conduct that we also provide to the kids before they attend the events, and it sets out as to we expect you to please do these things, which also includes, like, please don't abuse the local telephony on the site and things along those lines. Um, and also we include photographic consent as well. All of the photos that we use here on all of our um, presentations, we've got full consent from um, the parent, guardian, and or child, depending on the age, uh, to actually use these. We um, provide these in occasions where we are taking photos. Obviously, we don't take photos all the time. But it's just for specific reasons. Um, but we also give them the option to opt out. And also opt out at any time. Just because you say, yes, I can use that photo. You can contact me and I'll take it down anytime. That's fine. No problems. Um, and you're going to make sure you have that consent and explain what you're doing with that at all points in time. Uh, and also the same thing also applies if you're doing any digital events that also have images of kids. Depending as to what region of the world you're actually in, they may have international. So say, for example, if you're putting digital content onto YouTube and it contains images of kids, they have special, specific policies they need to adhere to, which you need to pay attention to. Um, yeah, never, never do it without consent. Always have consent and make sure you explain it at every point in time. And then over to platforms. Uh, we mentioned before that we use CTFD. And as a mentor, it's really important when we're helping the kids with these platforms that we've at least practiced using them and that we're aware of the content and aware of how the platform works. Um, so that's just another thing that you should be preparing uh, if you're going to run these events is uh, like, and it's not just useful for the mentors to be across it. It also helps us do our quality assurance on, on the content that we're putting out there. Yeah, and also when it comes to the platforms as well, you need to understand as to how those platforms are handling that data, what is happening to that data when you're actually um, using them because you're working with kids here. You should be um, looking at including privacy by design when it comes to your platform selection and also implementation, and also concepts such as safety by design, which includes making sure that the platform cannot be misused to create unsafe environments. So when it comes to us and how we use these particular platforms, we make sure we anonymize all of the data when it comes to any of the participants and the kids. We do that beforehand and we lock it down so it can't be um, accidentally traced back or um, by anyone accessing that particular platform so it can't be misused. And then another thing that we look at for running our workshops is how we actually split up the kids. Um, so I'm going to use PNG as an example. We did um, a junior's day and a senior's day, so that was splitting by age. And then we also um, got a bit of like a pre-grading just from the parents kind of informal about what their skill level would already be. So then we could also split by skill level because, um, yeah, we find that kids, they don't want to see someone charging ahead while they're struggling and they don't want to be bored while everyone else is getting up to speed. So by splitting by skill level, it really helps. Um, like it just helps. <laughs> uh, one thing that we never do, though, is split by gender. Um, yeah, that's we love having all the kids work together. Uh, but we, we're not super strict on how we split by age because uh, like if there's friends who are different age or especially if there's siblings, that would fall into two different age brackets, we're okay for them to uh, pick whichever session they want to go to so that they can stay together. Yep, and when it comes to staying together as well, the kids will automatically split into groups during the work that they're doing. And even though it may be individual work, for example, working on the cyber games, they'll be working together to actually solve problems and it's something which happens naturally. Although you'll find though in practice when it comes to the different age groups and the different skill levels, that they'll automatically do that group sorting and working very in very different ways, which is interesting to see. But always make sure we're, when we're doing this, we practice inclusion as well. Um, and when it comes to our events, we never discriminate by age, 
se um, age, sex, gender, um, or ability, or religious background at any point in time. Uh, so this is a little bit about what you should be bringing to your workshops for running those <laughs> workshops, which hopefully hopefully we're bringing the energy today because one of our big points is um, you for kids' events, you have to bring a lot of positive energy because they will feed off that and I'll give it back to you as well. So uh, it's just so important. Um, we also, we've talked a lot about like not leaving kids behind. So just paying attention to the kids and whether that's just paying attention to them in the room and whether they're kind of sitting there and not doing much or whether you're watching the back end of the CTF and seeing that they're not scoring many points or anything. Um, paying attention is how you can then target help. Um, and that's really, yeah, important. Uh, we keep it really interactive. So we do ask a lot of questions. We'll do some drawing, we'll do some hands-on. Um, like whatever the workshop is, there'll be hands-on components. Not too much talking with the kids, not, not like this amount of talking. <laughs> um, and we, we reward uh, all participation. Did we bring some caramel koalas? Today? I do, I have a bag full yeah. of caramel koalas for anyone who asks a question at the end of this. Yeah, so, so there will be rewards. <laughs> <laughs> Always with the rewards. And we start with some polling questions. So no matter how much we'd already tailored the workshops and already tried to plan ahead of what we thought we knew, we would start each session with some polling questions of who knows, like for my workshop, I'll talk about that one, um, who knows what code is, who accesses the internet, um, like, yeah, getting them to define some things and just do raises of hands of how many people know something or do something. And then that helps us to kind of tailor the content on the fly as well. And also something when it comes to taking those sort of straw polls of classes, those are things you should be capturing for um, post-event reporting. You should be capturing all of the information. So when you've asked as to how many people have been to Diana before, those are information I'd be actually capturing as to how many people raised their hand, how many people were in the room when this started, and how many people were here at the end. What's the reaction and engagement? You should be recording all of this so you can actually provide um, improvement activities for your future events. And that's what we have, we've been making sure that we do every time is that we take the feedback and we apply it and then we can try something new and then take feedback from that. We're constantly evolving every event that we actually deliver. And yeah, it's totally worth it. Yeah, our stuff totally gets better. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, sharing is caring. Uh, there was recently a study that was put out by the UK government uh, in regards to cybersecurity education for our ages, I think it was 5 through to 16, and they found that there was actually quite a lot of groups that were delivering community education that included cybersecurity within the UK. But one of the main points that they discovered is that people are not sharing that information between groups. So um, in the sharing is caring aspect, what we've done is taken our whole framework that we actually work from. It's actually available on our website now at securityday.com slash event resources, or you can probably just click through the resources tab on our website. And we've got all of that available up there. I would like to make that available to anyone that's interested in doing these sort of events. Please tailor it. It's a huge amount of information. It's also prevented at a like, very high level. And depending on the country that you're with, obviously our policies may not apply, but it's a good baseline. It's somewhere to start from because when we started doing this, none of this existed and it didn't exist publicly. Um, so please feel free to use our stuff. Um, we're more than happy for other people to do so. Um, and if you'd like to look at our previous workshops, um, you, we've also got some of them available on YouTube as well. And if anyone wants to go and put together their own um, community workshop, we're more than happy to assist you with any of these particular things. Um, get in contact. Uh, we've helped out quite a lot of organisations over the past couple of years with resources, and we're always happy to help out. And in Otter News, <laughs> what's next? So um, what we're going to be doing is um, expanding our support in the Pacific. Uh, we have some programs that we're working on with some organizations who, at the time of us 
giving this presentation. We can't talk about it publicly yet, but we hope to be able to do so soon. Um, and also, we'll be continuing to work with CPL Foundation, as we covered earlier. We provided train-the-trainer sessions, so there's local educators now which have the skills and the workshop ability. So where we went and worked with 120 kids in this PNG cohort when we first went over there, they can now take those out and move throughout the community and be able to continue to repeat this. So they'll be continuing this locally. Um, we're providing some, some support to them ongoing to be able to do that, obviously, um, if they've got any questions, we're here to help. Um, and also seeing like initial hosting and content design until they can get up on their feet. Um, but yeah, so they are going and running their own individual event, I think in November. And then they'll be running the second one in April of next year. So they're continuing on this after we've left them. So, and that's, that's fantastic. And yeah, we're still doing our Australian events as well. So we've got uh, Canberra coming up later this month. Uh, which is where we're from. And then we've also got Melbourne uh, scheduled for February next year. So, go forth and share your skills and knowledge. So, <laughs> Do we want to get a show of hands of who thinks that they'll actually take this stuff out there and be doing some kids' events potentially? Excellent. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so, yeah. Today we've covered like how we um, deliver our workshops, what we think about, what we're bringing to them. And um, yeah, PNG initially it seemed challenging, uh, but on all fronts, the outcomes, it really seemed quite successful. And like Heidi was saying, the local work is ongoing and they're, they're reaching further and further. Um, and yeah, we encourage other countries to consider approaching um, these types of outreach um, programs. Yeah, yeah, so, and we've also provided that framework. Um, so hopefully if you're walking into this blind, you actually have a framework that you can run through um, to um, at least consider starting up these events. Obviously tailor it, and there's things that we run with uh, individual events that aren't obviously on there, but this is our high level framework as to what we consider every time we actually um, look at designing these events. And that comes from everything from the educational side as to the workshop content, um, making sure ethics are considered when you're developing these workshops, for example. How can this be abused? How can this be reused in a way that maybe, re maybe um, something you should reconsider. How can you actually um, develop positive lessons to embed in these particular workshops, for example? It goes into all of that at a very detailed scale, so please do check that out. Um, and so it covers the people, the policies, the platforms, and the education and the events. And we encourage you to have a look into the detailed breakdown. Uh, and if this is something you're considering doing, uh, we're more than happy to lend a hand. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Should we check the questions? Um, at all our events, we set a minimum performance indication of did you have fun and did you learn something new? And we hope that you have today. Thank you very much. And do you have any questions? There's one question. Oh, he, oh sorry. <laughs> Can I get you a microphone? Oh, okay. So, so I'm biased because I want the koala candy. Um, the question is, uh, are your resources open source or is this like you're sharing the high level framework? Um, so the resources that we provide on our site, I think the Creative Commons is if you're going to actually use it, uh, you should probably at least quote as to where you got it from. But apart from that, you're allowed to just do whatever you want with it. Thank you. I'll find you a caramel koala. <laughs> and there was another. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I love the idea that you've got this framework that you're putting together for everyone. Um, on the framework, like, have you, like, given your Papua New Guinea experience um, and your, your dealing with the, virtu you know, the virtual trainings and stuff, does your framework provide guidance or, or you know, uh, guides as to how to deal with, say, a, you know, going and doing training in, say, uh, um, a tech-challenged uh, community versus a um, I guess tech rich community or or doing you know how your framework might support a virtual type training versus the in-person training so um, starting 
from the end of that question and I'll work backwards. So we do actually put in the considerations as to um, the way that it's actually set up is that we look at it as to whether or not it's an in-person or whether it's a digital delivery as to whether or not particular considerations exist as mandatory or not. Um, uh, but yeah, so that side, yes, it does. Uh, when it comes to delivering with um, low-tech versus high-tech, um, it's considered within venue, um, within venue and event considerations. So if you're going to be running a digital event, you need to be able to make sure that you have digital capability within that event space. Um, and how you assess that really all depends as to whether or not um, you have that ability to be able to utilize broadband um, available or whether or not you um, have the ability to provide local tethering. So say, for example, do you, do you have a portable satellite station? Some people do, right? And so it's, it really all depends as to what you are working with on your unique um, use case. So, but it is a consideration. Or did you mean more high tech, low tech, like capability, literacy? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, also, yes, that is also consideration. You should always design for um, the lowest skill sets and the highest skill sets, and you should test it and such as well. But yeah, it is on there. If you have any questions in regards to it, please, please do get in contact, and we're we'll happy to provide more details. Hi. Um, so I just have a few questions, actually, and one kind of relates to his, um, how do you assess the skill level of the kids? Okay, so prior to events or during events? I, either, really. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know if you do it prior or if you do it during. So how, how do you make that separation, you said, between the, the groups? So uh, when it comes to prior to events, it's um, prior to events, we actually just ask the parents as okay. to how they would actually assess. But we also ask the parents how they feel their tech skill level is, right. because that also affects as to how they rate their kids. Right, so it's more of a self-assessment. Yeah, so okay. it's more of a self-assessment. Um, at the moment, um, our program uh, has not ever been asked to do assessments of the kids, okay. and, during, and we haven't actually as a result. We're, we're, we're super protective of the information mm -hmm. of the kids. Um, so we never do individual assessments of the kids during the work, and that's not something we record. Okay. And then um, kind of in that same vein, I know my kids, they know how to use a smartphone, they know how to use a tablet, no problem, but put an actual laptop in front of them, and mm -hmm. it's like a completely different ball game. So how does that, do you have um, like kind of like app-based kind of like the tablet kind of format, or is it all on like a laptop, PC, what... Okay, so um, in regards to the, so, okay, so talking about PNG, for example, with Papua New Guinea, uh, the way that that was, put, that was actually set up was laptops. And we had a mouse for every kid. A mouse as well. Yeah. But it also had the option, because they had the laptops with the touch screen, they could either use the guide point in the middle okay. or the actual touchpad themselves. Were they touch screen? I can't remember. I don't Sorry. think they were. Yeah. We also, we stripped back everything that was presented to the kids on the laptop and we laid out several bookmarks that corresponded to all the different workshops so that the resources they needed were just shortcuts from the desktop uh, right. to help a little bit with, like, not having extra noise that would confuse. Mm -hmm. So when it also comes to the design of the... Um, Workshops, games, etc. Um, you need to take into account uh, that, say, for example, when you're working with the younger groups, you'll be focusing very heavily on uh, pictures, yep. um, images, mm -hmm. and um, preferably simple to interact with. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're not actually able to use um, a tablet, for example, to access a site and perform activities on it. It's probably not actually the platform that you want to be using. Does that help answer some yeah, of the questions? Yeah, it does make sense. Like I noticed in my, um, in my kids' schools, they opt to purchase tons of iPads as opposed to having like the old computer lab. It's just yep. more like user-friendly, but there is a difference between the way you, you, know, you use them, right? Yeah. So I just wanted to know kind of what was 
um, like preferred or, or how the format was working. Um, I'm the one of the district parental advisory committee representatives for our um, two school districts. And so it would be really interesting to be able to get this type of thing implemented um, as an after school program. So um, I guess a follow up to that would be what are the lengths, like the length of time for each workshop? Is it a couple of hours? Is it a weekender? Like how does that? So 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Okay, perfect. Per workshop because we find that after 45 minutes, the kids will zone out. Yeah. Um, and we start to have a lot of loss of interaction. Being okay. more than 45 minutes at a time, you, it's not beneficial. Right. Um, sometimes we can get workshops that will go over, mm -hmm. but um, the point seems to get lost at that point. But, yeah, 45 minutes is ideal time per workshop subject. Okay, that and I noticed you had six subjects up there, so yep. it could very easily be a once-a-week, six-week program. So say, for example, if you're looking at, like, a day with a lower event, yep. we'll start off, we'll do a 45-minute workshop, and then we'll do, like, a quick break, or okay. then we'll do, like, a scene change, and we'll, we'll just change the workshop type, and then we'll go for another 45 minutes, then we'll have morning tea, right. and then we'll go for another 45 minutes, and we'll have lunch, and then we'll okay. go for another 45 minutes, and then we have a brown break, and then we go for another 45 minutes and we end the day. Perfect. So, And then as far as training goes, you said that uh, technical skills can be learned. Um, is there a training program for teachers or um, learning assistant um, people that work in the school districts? Oh, that's not actually something we've been asked to do. We, we train all our mentors internally at mm -hmm. the moment. But if anyone would actually like to come and hop on board and run through our mentor training sessions, we'd be more than happy to include other people. But that's not currently something we've even, ever been asked for. Okay. But more than happy to share any of our resources. We do have um, to train the trainer workshops. That's a, a beginning. <laughs> and are train the trainer workshops or, or training available online? Pardon, sorry. Would the, train, would the training be available online for whoever chooses to? Yep. Yep. So okay. our, our next refresher for the trainer trainer is delivered entirely via digital content um, online. Our, our preference, so, so we can do digital delivery, but yep. we really prefer to do in person, um, especially when it comes to like working with the kids. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the online um, train the trainer, we're happy to do that digital delivery, and that's what okay. our next session actually is. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So that's like five caramel koalas. <laughs> if I can find them in my bag. Oh, no, we actually got that comment about the koalas. There's another, there's another question from the back. Oh, well, actually, if, one moment. I, want, I had a question that kind of dovetails onto yours here. I saw this come in. It says, yeah, I, and we're, there, we're seeing quite a few questions. Um, those uh, mentors and teachers, how do you recruit them? Oh, uh, okay. So well, the last few. So we have an online sign-up. Uh, we um, also um, go and uh, speak to people at local information security association meetups, talks. Um, a lot of it's word of mouth as well. And also people that know people that would be a good fit. Um, and it's just around that sort of area. I, it's, most of our mentors work in security in some area. But when I say uh, in security, we have like, the last two people who have come online were a pen tester, a project manager, and also a policy. And when we think of cybersecurity, so many people think of pen testing, for example, or incident response. But we still need those project managers, and we still need those policy people. And there are very valid mentors to be able to introduce to kids um, and um, career opportunities as well. All right, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit here. Uh, how would you handle safety issues like people who might be posing as children who, or who might ask kids to send photos of themselves? I guess that's part of your mm, yeah. security training. Yeah, that, that's definitely very much part of it. We, uh, when it comes to the mentors on the day, we tell them, uh, we very, very, very clearly ask them to not continue direct contact with any of the kids past this workshop. If, they, if the parents want to get in contact with us, uh, we can relay questions and answers, but it's very based on the day. One of our also basic principles as well is that um, buddy system. At no point in time should an adult be left alone with a child in any particular situation. It's always um, two mentors minimum at any given point in time. 
and we rely on um, checking each other as to appropriateness. Yeah, if we saw that we were the last yellow shirt in a room, we would just walk out of that room until we had another person come back with us. Yeah, it's, and that's part of the basic training. Uh, you mentioned testing content with folks with uh, different uh, skill sets, skill levels. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process for uh, testing and refining content? Um, so straight off, when it comes to testing, um, like say, for example, the cyber games, we'll make sure that all the mentors actually run through it. Uh, and we also make sure that when they're actually running through it, a lot of people we don't give any background information on and just get them to do it. And it's really fantastic. So say, for example, if you have like an open source intelligence question and you don't give them any prep on how to actually solve it, you'll get some interesting ways of testing. And it's a really good way to, um, to deal with kids to make sure that it's not actually coming across um, inappropriate information. So say, for example, um, the last CTF we actually put together, um, one of the questions, if you Googled it in a certain way, it would come up with a link to someone's OnlyFans site. But however, if you change the, con the way that the question was phrased, you did not have search results that would end up in something like that. It was really interesting. But that's like what the we name use. of a local river or something, and yeah. Yeah, a river, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We won't say what exactly it was, but yeah, um, yeah. And so we use that as actual playthrough testing. Um, also, when it comes to the statistics, oh, I'll be really quick. We we'll look through the answers and to check as to how things actually went in the back end um, to see as to which of the questions had really really high fail rates. And sees, and we can also usage. with CTFD, you can also see as to what answers have been put in for specific questions, and so it means that you can actually go through an error check in that way as well. There's multiple different facets as to ways you can do it, and also changing on the time. And he, I'm having a zero held up at me, which means I think we're out of time. Thank you very much, everyone. It'd be lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. Yes.